Amazing. Uh, so welcome everyone to week 10 of the OLS uh, cohort, cohort five, co cohort hope to be precise. Um, we're going to run through a few reminders as we always do before we kick off the call. Uh, so first thing that I just want to remind uh, is that we have a code of conduct and community participation guidelines. If you're following along on the etherpad, um, uh, then line 57 there is a link to the code of conduct as a general rule this means treat one another with respect and the way that you would like to be treated by someone else um, if at any point you either experience or witness something that isn't in line with that you can report that uh, and that that will be um, to myself Berenice, Malvika, Emmy and um, I was going to say and yo but that's me again uh, at team at openlifesci.org that's um, who reaches that, that address or you can report it individually to any one of us um, first name at openlifesci.org the info for that is on line 60 of the etherpad um, while you are just settling in getting comfortable there we have an icebreaker question uh, what music artist audiobook or book have you been listening or reading to these days listening to or reading there we go, the um, grammar there was slightly strange. Um, and you can also add your name and the attendee list round about line 34 at the moment. Um, we also have an Otter AI transcript. So this is just an automatic transcript that uh, types out, um, tries to guess what we say and types it out in words. Um, you can see that on the top left where it says live on otter.ai to follow along. Um, this isn't available, however, in breakout rooms. So, um, I think we'll only have one breakout room today, given the size of the call. <laughs> um, but uh, just uh, please, what we ask if you're participating is that in your Zoom name, if you click on um, the participant list and then click on more, then you can rename yourself um, and say whether you want a written or a spoken room. So we ask if you prefer to interact in a written way that you put W in front of your name, or if you prefer a spoken breakout room, put S in front of your name. And that just helps us sort you. Um, we may have to ask people to specifically go for a type of room given the size the size of uh, group we have today um is there anything else that i've missed my head's shaking perfect okay uh in that case emmy do you want to kick off the actual subject matter of the call i can thanks so much yo for setting us up um really excited today uh we are having our second open science call. Um, and this call is all about sharing your open project more broadly and looking at ways that we can disseminate knowledge. So um, today you will, we will learn about um, the motivations and practicalities in practicing open science. And that's of course different for every one of us. So we'll get a chance to reflect a little bit and share that with each other. Um, we'll have a uh, amazing speakers who will share their experience and knowledge in um, sharing knowledge for training in preprints, DOIs and citations. Um, and I think in open access actually. Um, so, so lots of exciting things to look forward to. Um, so without further ado, I um, would love to welcome our first speaker, Joy Owango. Um, whenever you're ready, Joy. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, here we go. Oh, all right. Started with the end. Uh, okay. Um, just a second. Right. Are you able to see the screen? Yep. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm the executive director of the Training Center in Communication. This is a research capacity trust uh, based in Kenya and hosted by the University of Nairobi. And uh, we are the founding partner for Africa Archive. So my presentation will be on both what we do and what we are doing with Africa Archive in facilitating the ownership of African scholarly content. Okay, and with the use of personal identifiers and also with preprints as well. So there's been a claim that only 0.1% of scholarly content is said to come from Africa, yet we are over 1.3 billion. Well, this is not true. Instead, the work is not discoverable because there's been regional bias in Western journals, uh, especially when it comes to editorial teams regarding African uh, scholarly output. Um, African scholar scholars are inclined to list Western partner institutions instead of African home institutes. 
And this is a big problem that we are seeing. Not only, it's not even an African problem, it's something that we are going to we see a lot in the global south. They're more inclined to accredit the, the global north partner and uh, not their, where they are housed. A large proportion uh, of present and historical African scholarly output is still in print. So though that is changing, uh, the bulk of our output is still in print and we can see universities trying their best to digitize their older content to make it much more accessible. There's bottlenecks in infrastructural networks and challenges, and also, of course, there's challenge with network connectivity. So this is also changing, but it's also one of the biggest challenges. The infrastructural bit is such a big problem when it comes to the visibility of African research output. Um, so because of this, we felt that it was important, and the, the, this, and the worst the, the, the thing about this whole issue is that there was no platform that was showcasing African research output, okay, whether it was at national or regional level. So everything was segregated. So what happened is that African uh, Africa Archive was created and it is a community led platform for African scientists of any discipline to present their research findings and connect with other researchers. So what, what we've done is that we've partnered with current with six uh, established scholarly repositories and the objective is to support researchers at this stage, individual researchers, whereby when they put in their research uh, output, it can be spread in any of these platforms. So they can choose which of these platforms they can uh, they can have their, plat their, their research output uh, further increased in terms of visibility. Now, why this is important is that we are trying to go around the infrastructural challenge. So we cannot sit down and say that, well, because of infrastructural challenges, we cannot, we cannot uh, in present or uh, increase the visibility of African researchers. So we, the only way we had to go around it was to partner with existing repositories so that there's a ripple effect or a replication in, in terms of the, of the visibility of replication of the output so that there's, a, there's increased visibility of, for, for the researcher. Um, so we've been submitting, all, as you can see in this screen, we've been accepting preprints that are going through Zenodo, they're going through the platform itself, they're also going through uh, Chaos and Figshare and Science Open and PubPub. So when you look at PubPub, PubPub uh, indices, um, audiovisual. So during COVID-19, we, we realized we we're receiving abstracts that were in audiovisual format. So we started indexing them. And uh, that is a good way to start showing the kind of output that is coming out of the continent. Because you see, it comes down to infrastructural support. So we had to go around that challenge to make sure that we are able to increase the visibility of African research output. So now, one of the things we've done and we felt was very important was to provide uh, identifiers for each and every single output that is indexed within uh, Africa Archive. So for individual researchers, we encourage them to have ORCID IDs and they can log into Africa Archive using their ORCID IDs, which is extremely important because it helps not only in disambiguating their, 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 their name variants, but it also collates all, aggregates all their output. Uh, for institutions, they, we, we are we are working with ROA and then for digital and we provide digital object identifiers for scholarly output. So in this case, and for data, we are working with data sites as well. So you're looking at data site and cross -web. Now this is extremely important because it also gives security and, and wins the trust for the authors because one of the biggest challenges in, in the global south, especially when we are partnering with researchers in the global north is loss of data. Okay, through collaborations, there's a lot, there's loss of data. So when all manner of output is assigned a DOI, the researcher in the global south, and when I say the global south, it's even including the point, uh, Africa, gets to have some level of data sovereignty and research sovereignty. So that wins the trust of the author as well. So using assigning digital object identifiers is really important, especially when you want a researcher to put in their data or an unfinished manuscript or a manuscript that is just about to be published on an open platform like Africa Archive. So the objective for Africa Archive is any African researcher 
who is conducting their work can put their, their work through the, that platform. That is number one. Or anyone outside Africa can put their, their research. Anyone who is non-African but is doing research on Africa can put their research into the platform to increase the visibility. So we're in a situation where we have publishers putting in their content within the platform to increase the visibility of their African scholarly content that is in their libraries. This continent has over 2,000 languages, all right? So because of that, we still come from the uh, notion that English is the language of science. And because of the low diversity in language, we are not seeing output coming out of the continent. And some of the, the indigenous languages in the continent are national languages. So if you're looking at Amharic, if you're looking at Swahili, if you're looking at Igbo, Okay, or Kinyarwanda or Luganda. These are national languages, but they are also indigenous languages. So you find output written, research output, research being written in some of these languages. So we need, even though there's a need for common language to connect, there's also a need to increase the diversity of the link of the output, research output that is done in national languages or indigenous languages. So what we are trying to do is create a balance of both by using technology to support as much as possible. So number one, what we've started doing is indexing the African Union languages. So these are the integration languages of the continent. Obviously English, then we have Swahili, uh, we have uh, French, Arabic, Portuguese. These are the integration languages of the entire continent and they're also known as the African Union languages. But at the same time, what we are doing is making research done in English translated into some of the national languages. Okay, so so we have research that have that uh, have been translated into Yoruba, Africa, uh, into in Isizulu, Amharic. So we are looking at a situation whereby um, African uh, where English research that has been done in English can also be translated into African languages. And with time, we are looking at also translating what has been done in English into into what has been what has been submitted in the indigenous national or national languages into English as well. So we are looking at a balance of both. At the end of the day, what we are looking at is increasing the visibility of African research output. So through our partnership with one of the repository science open, we are able to collate research on uh, we, we have a, a, a date uh, we are able to collate information on COVID-19 and what has come out very powerfully is that we're able to see the amount of work that is being produced by African researchers when it comes to COVID-19. So there's more than this, obviously, but what is what you're seeing is that there are weekly updates on the amount of research that African researchers are producing on COVID-19. Pretty much what you're trying to say is that We've created an opportunity for African research to be accessible and visible, and you see the contribution of African researchers to the knowledge uh, to, to the knowledge economy, especially when it comes to to research. So the opportunities that exist is increasing digitally discoverability of African research continent. We want to build our own scientometrics based on measurable output that we are producing. You're working with established infrastructure providers for long-term digital storage. And you're looking at evidence-based policy in ME of output contextualized to the needs of African research stakeholders. So those are the things that we are looking at as uh, the next steps in growing Africa archive. So how do we come in as TCC Africa? As I said, we are the founding partner uh, for the for Africa Archive. When it started, it was a community-based organization. When we came in, we were, our objective was to provide a, a legal and financial framework so that the organization can be sustainable. So one of the biggest challenges with preprint repositories is that unless they are assigned to a publisher or a society, they are, it's really difficult to, to have them sustainable. So we are looking at, since this is a regional, it's a continental platform, you're looking at ways to make it sustainable so that you can, we can win the trust of African authors and they can use it, they can use the platform to, to, to aggregate their data and collate their data. As a center, TCC Africa, we've been in existence for 15 years. We've supported over 13,000 researchers at master's and PhD level in their research life cycle. We've worked in over 80 institutes and we have worked in over 40 African countries. And between when Africa Archive was launched and 2021, when we created our partnership, that was late 2021, that is October, 
uh, Africa Archive had already received submissions from over 33 African countries. Okay. And if you can see on the, the right hand side, this is the, the amount uh, of these are the public, these are these are the percent, the degree to which uh, we had the the, the 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 degree to which we had uh, received research, uh, we had received re, uh, research output from various disciplines, with medicine and health being the the leading research area and law being the lowest. So medicine at 14.1% and law at 0.2%. But they, what you can clearly see is that is the multidisciplinary nature of this platform where it is accepting um, research output from uh, various uh, research areas. Now, what we are trying to do is debunk the lack of visibility of African research output. We are trying to build the sovereignty of research output and create a narrative where African researchers are capable and able of increasing the visibility of their output through partnership. And this is pretty much through partnership. And also the most important thing is also highlighting African uh, research output that has been done in indigenous language, promoting indigenous lang uh, research done in indigenous language, but most importantly, winning the trust of authors and increasing their visibility. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Joy. Round of virtual applause for Joy's talk. Um, oops. I just lost you briefly there. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really enlightening and um, yeah, just 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 amazed by by the work that Africa Archive and, and the TCC are doing in 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 the continent and in the space as well. Um, I'm just looking through. Um, folks, if you have any questions uh, for Joy, please feel free to put it in the chat. And also, we have a we have a couple of questions on the Etherpad as well. But please please feel free to add your own. So I'm going to go through. Uh, there's a comment that says, um, "Joy, your notes about African researchers often using Western affiliations are both fascinating and sad." Um, yeah, it's. Yeah, I, we hope that this this maybe. Um, do you see that like uh, sort of going down, or is there a trend? Yes, of, like, this is still it it is going down, fortunately, because even before the rise of Africa Archive, you know, you 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 have meetings with with the uh, directors of research or deputy vice chancellors of universities. And you just show them what the world is seeing. You're seeing less output coming out of the, the university and yet they would comfortably say we produced more. And a quick scan on any database, you'd see that the researchers are not citing their institutes. So we are seeing more African institutes making it mandatory for their institutes to be, to be assigned as or acknowledged in, in publications. And that is just a basic thing that would 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 uh, would that would trigger the lack of visibility of any institute. So it's slowly changing, and I don't think for most researchers it's also the the lack of awareness on what constitutes funding. You know, sometimes they think the funding is the fiscal bit, but funding is also the input that you you that is provided for you so the inputs you have the infrastructure support from the institute you have the human capacity support so that needs to be acknowledged as well so I, it's slowly changing but yeah that was a big problem yeah um it sounds like it's a, it's a long journey ahead but i'm glad to hear that you know folks are starting to realize the importance of of really attributing the work from the right place yes. um yeah um, just ha have another question for you. Um, what you, because you mentioned supporting sustainability of uh, African publishers and publishing initiatives. What sort of sustainability strategies have you been looking at? So what we're looking at is building community. You see, this is owned by Africans and it's for Africans. So it's the whole. We want them to be part of this process and co-own it. And the, and what the only way that can be done is building a, a fiscal community in which they get the support for the submission of, of their manuscripts within the platform. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we are seeing being done by quite a number of organizations, not necessarily live in Africa archive. And the only way you can be sustainable is building, especially if you're not for profit, is to build community. And then um, if you're working with publishers, encouraging them to join the community so that 
it also makes it easy for researchers to have access to to journals that they could publish in. So it's just building an ecosystem whereby everyone in that research life cycle, whether it is the library, whether it's the publisher, or even uh, the library and the publisher and any, uh, and any high education stakeholder is part of that community. And they just provide a fiscal commitment to being part of that community to help the researcher because it's free for the researcher, but the institutes have to be have how to make a fiscal investment in to be part of that community yes very interesting yeah lots lots to for for all of us to learn from 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 that sort of model there yeah um it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's great that you're really leading the the way in terms of how we are we are um, finding a solution towards sustainability in the longer run um That's true, because funding is limited and not all regions have support of the government. And I think that is what maybe Alex is going to talk more about because in, in Latin, in South America, there's quite a bit of support in that, in open access in Africa. And when I say support, there's government support. In Africa, we are just getting into it. So you have to be innovative on ways on being sustainable. And funding is limited. We can't go all to the same funder for the same kind of activity. So we have to think outside the box such that funding becomes a secondary source of revenue. Uh, the government supports also becomes a secondary form of revenue, yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I've just got a, a seeing, looking at the chat here and Yafsi, I have a, have a question. What is the process of publishing in African languages? In what sense? What do you mean? Oh, publishing in African languages. There, there are quite a number of small academic publishers who are already producing journals in African languages, especially in countries where the indigenous language is the national language. So this is very common in Ethiopia, where Amharic is, is, is the national language, and also in Tanzania and Zanzibar, where Swahili is the national language and is also the indigenous language. So you find, this is very common. So you'll find any kind of research that is produced either is done in English, written in English, or it is written in Swahili. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and, and just looking at the question, because, um, uh, you know, did you have anyone push back against the idea of research papers in indigenous, indigenous languages? So, for example, they would say like, oh, um, language X is the lingua franca of science. And how did you convince or convince them? Say that again. Like uh, assuming that, is there anyone who, you know, pushed back or, or rejected the idea of uh, having research papers in indigenous languages? Um, no, no, because you see, they, they understand, okay, first of all, coming from a country with a continent with which has a diversity of languages. We are cognizant of the fact that some of our languages are dying, but we also understand the value of our national in uh, on the unif on how our national languages unify us. Okay, and the pushback. There's been no pushback. If anything, there's been an, a demand in increase in. Um, on research output, if it can be av made available in indigenous languages as well. And this is just not only in research, even from a literature perspective, we are seeing a lot of, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a growth of African authors writing in, in their indigenous language as well. So this is something that we've been seeing for quite some time. And pretty much it comes down to the decolonization of research. So you, you want, you want to show that yes, we have, we can we've been conducting research, and yes, it was done in our indigenous or national language, and it is accessible to the audience that speaks that language. That is that's the objective, and it can be translated to the global north so that everybody can have access to it. It's the same concept as if the if research was done in China and it was written in Mandarin. Same logic, same logic, yeah. Definitely, that's that's great. Um, that you know, we, that that yeah, of course. Uh, it's, when you have so such a language diversity, it's great that you know everyone is proud of it and appreciates it. So I'm glad yes. that that's that's the case here. 
Thank you so much, Joy. Um, it's been it's been really fascinating to learn about um, you know the publishing and the ecosystem on the on the continent, and again learn from your great work. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good thank day. You. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Right, folks. We're gonna head into a um, quiet reflection exercise. Um, so this is I'm now following on the Etherpad on line 110. Um, so we'd like you to. Uh, Come back to a little bit to your own uh, work and think about what sort of things within your projects can be shared, why, um, or in this case, if you want to elaborate on sort of how in what language, please feel free to do. Um, you can also, uh, we also like you to think about um, what should not be shared and why those things shouldn't be shared. So um, on the etherpad under line 115, um, there's a bit of space, we're going to add a bit more. Um, but we'd like you to take five minutes, think about these questions, and uh, if you are comfortable, share your thoughts on the Etherpad. So, do we have any questions? Was I clear? All right, give us a shout if you're lost. Um, we'll have a bit of silent Etherpadding for the next five minutes.
All right. Just watching these lovely colored lines growing longer and longer. It's beautiful to see. Thank you. Does anyone wanna take the Zoom floor <laughs> and um, share a bit of what you've thought about? I think everyone is sort of busy writing or reading other people's comments. <laughs> Can I share one reflection? Um, it's about a conversation I had a while back uh, with someone where they um, they were talking about, um, I think, codes of conduct. And they were like, but if it's a truly open project, then shouldn't all codes of conduct actually be open? um I like a code, code of conduct reports I think they were saying handle them in the open and at first that might seem oh yeah that makes sense but then if you think about the uh think about it a little more and you think about the ramifications of people being afraid to come forward if it's only ever open it's one of those good scenarios where you I think realizing that the ramifications of something being open can stop it happening at all which is a, an important thing to note maybe That's a very important point. Um, as a, like what the tension that I noticed there is that one between open and safety, right? It, there are so many ways that openness can build that safety, um, but also so many ways that folks will feel more unsafe in, in the public, let's say. Um, and that is just so hard to pin down to a single rule. Um, because humans are amazing. <laughs> in, in some ways, I'm having a philosophical day. Sorry. <laughs> Anyone um, have any sort of reflections on that, or any other things that you've been thinking about? I'm also noting here that there's a comment about sort of legal, cultural, and system hoops. Um, and I'm curious, very curious. Uh, does anyone, this person in pink, <laughs> would you like to elaborate on that? Hello, Amy, it's me, Piv. Um, so uh, I'm talking um, kind of a lot about uh, things around GDPR um, and working within an international organization that has kind of certain rules and how information about people can be transferred. Um, there's also a bit of a cultural gap, I think, um, around um, people knowing that open science or open data sharing um, can happen, but sometimes there can be a lack of uh, kind of information or knowledge that then turns into a lack of will, is what I perceive at least. I don't know whether anyone has also um, seen that in their work. Thanks, Piv. Um, anyone has sort of similar or different experiences in terms of thinking about the legal frameworks that may or may not stop us from doing open science? Bottle says cultural gap is huge. Definitely. Uh, just yeah. I would like to share what Viv just said. For example, here, even if you want to share like data um, early in your research, what you're going to share is something like Zenodo and Picture, which is literally hosted outside like the country. That could be because it's hosted outside, you could be charged, even though like you have really a good intention, just want to share your data early in your research. But because all these repositories are not hosted inside your country, you could be charged for it. So there's like culture gap, there's legal um, yeah, issues that, um, so what Bev just said uh, resonated a lot with me. Yeah. Thank you, Batul. Um, if I can add, this something quite specific to my project, but 
uh, with this question, I got to think about um, the contribution that very young, maybe uh, STEM students could give to a project like the one I'm trying to develop. So it, it is like an, an educational resource where everyone can contribute um, a little work towards workshops about open science in a specific topic. And of course, this is addressed to even school kids or like undergraduate students, for example, and they are absolutely welcome to contribute, but I can see for them uh, that it could be a problem, especially uh, according to where they are, the country they, they come from, their language. Um, so maybe this should kind of generate a discussion about how to train these people first and make them feel comfortable about what can be shared and what they are they have a right to share in a way right like the knowledge that they can share or like without being afraid of like getting something wrong um so yeah that's probably an aspect of my project I didn't get to think much about but um it's something that could be developed a sort of like little training for the youngest contributors um and how they should uh, kind of uh, approach um their their contribution towards a project like that That is that is a very profound thought, <laughs> I, because yeah, I, I do think like we don't, at least like in the spaces that I have been in, um, we don't think about sort of legal protection or any mm. like very few protections until we get to the point where mm. we desperately need it, and that's usually too late. So I I. I really appreciate that you are mm. taking this opportunity to think about it and and yeah I mean sh please do share what you've learned on the way um yep. <laughs> with, with the rest of the community because I'd love to learn of course <laughs> thanks thank you um thank you all um in the interest of time um I'm going to move on but please feel free to revisit all your wonderful answers here on the notepad and especially those of you who are watching on YouTube um and contribute your own as well um, with that, I hand over to Batu. Oh, thank you, Amy, so much. So I'm very, very delighted to introduce Viv, who's going to speak about open training in low and middle income countries. Yeah, over to you, Viv. Thank you very much. At all, and thank you for the invitation from all the OLS organizers to deliver a talk today. Uh, just two checks. Can everyone see my screen and hear me OK? Fantastic, seeing lots of thumbs up. So um, my name is Dr. Piravin Piv Kapalasingham. My pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, and today I'll be delivering a talk on organizing open training in low and middle income countries. Um, the talk outline will just be a brief introduction to myself and what I do, uh, an introduction to training uh, as a whole, uh, and then going into the knowledge and skills dissemination via training in LMIX. Um, if I am talking too fast, do wave your hands or um, unmute and say something. I do have a tendency to get nervous and talk a lot. Um, just a quick question, because um, I want to make it slightly interactive. Uh, for those of you who are able to do so in the Zoom chat, could you indicate either by you know saying yes, no, maybe, um, if you've delivered or contributed to any training, whether professional or personal, uh, in your life, whether you're an adult or adolescent or even child? Seeing lots of yeses, this is a good sign. I can probably skip skip over a lot of the introduction. That's fantastic. So that's over half here. Possibly even approaching the 80% mark. So thank you for that. That's great to see. Um, many of you have been involved in training um, at all stages of the training um, kind of workflow. So from course concepts to design to delivery and feedback. Um, so some of this will not be new to you. Um, in terms of the role I have at EBI, the European Bioinformatics Institute, it's quite a varied one, but in short, it's anything to do with courses, whether it's supporting its design, organization, delivery, uh, supporting trainers with session design and delivery, uh, delivering instructor training, um, Within the Cabana project, which I'll talk about in a little moment, um, I've personally been um, getting a bit more experience in advocacy and policy for applied bioinformatics in, La in Latin America. Um, my previous experience has been in university teaching and a bit of structural biology research. Uh, and this role also encompasses um, roles like facilitation, coordination, and knowledge brokering in particular. 
Um, and these are just some examples, some nice little photos, um, either of the Institute I work in uh, or at home at the moment, um, or some of the trips I've taken as part of the Cabana project to learn more about how people are generating information, data, or doing uh, work um, in Latin America. So what does training look like? A lot of people think that training is, uh, or teaching, uh, looks like a live lecture or what's known as the chalk and talk or performing in front of a live audience in person. Uh, the truth is that has um, changed a lot over the last couple of years in terms of perception, but there's a long way to go to really get everyone thinking that training and education in general isn't just uh, regurgitating knowledge at someone and hoping they will learn. Um, trainees engage in different ways and if they can engage as much as possible, this will aid their learning. Um, so this can include doing things like group exercises, such as short presentations with each other, uh, quizzes, discussions, activities using collaborative boards and software or apps such as Menti, Kahoot, Google Forms. And a really important thing is that uh, training, uh, delivery and anything involving education can be virtualized and even you know, now explore hybrid models. Um, as well as this, it doesn't have to be live. It can be asynchronous. It can happen uh, at a self-paced manner. And all these are things that increase the inclusivity of uh, any training that is being done. So what's the problem in Latin America? A couple of years ago, uh, people noted there was an underrepresentation of Latin American researchers and data in large bio or biology type initiatives, such as the kind of Earth Biogenome Project or anything that really needs kind of world biodiversity data, um, crop security data, communicable disease data, uh, and that there was a slow uptake of data driven biology in the region. There were a couple of papers that discussed this in a bit more detail, and they found that even though kind of there was good bioinformatics research in Latin America, um, it's around half the world average in terms of scientific production in the field. Um, things have changed since. I think there is a follow-up paper, um, and this has improved. One thing that the Cabana project wanted to um, work on is to address this. Um, halfway through the project, um, we tried to look at the causes, and I put this here so that um, we can maybe talk about it a little bit afterwards. Um, language barriers was one idea. Reluctance of principal, investigator, uh, pr principal investigators to change uh, or changes in training. The fear of bioinformatics as a field by people who are not doing bioinformatics. Um, resources and infrastructure. A shortage of training in the life sciences in undergraduate programs, as well as short format training outside of these formal programs. Um, and finally, an availability of trainers. Um, so how were we going to address these kinds of issues? Um, in short, we were going to run 28 research secondments for train the trainer workshops, so instructors at instructor training. Uh, 28 short courses in bioinformatics and develop a number of e-learning resources um, around the challenge areas uh, of the project. Um, and underpinning all this are the concepts of open science, inclusivity and training at all career stages. So one of the things we observed was that there was a big need for training. However, there was also a need to change how a lot of us um, in kind of European settings were operating in these lower to middle income countries. Um, there were a lot of cultural misconceptions that had to be um, essentially erased and built on top of. One thing that was very clear from near the beginning was language barriers. Effective learning, simply put, is difficult in second, third and multiple languages. So you're going to enhance learning if you are doing it in kind of native languages. Um, there was a different infrastructure availability. One thing that was very clear was that for bioinformatics, sometimes the internet was required and in some areas, internet signal was um, too poor to do basic calls. Um, I personally experienced this where I couldn't log onto a, a website purely because the data wasn't high enough to get there. Um, the compute power in certain areas, it was an issue, um, electricity, and in some cases, um, fault lines for earthquakes. Um, that wasn't a huge barrier, but something to consider. Um, we also noticed a lack of time and or money. And a lot of this came under um, kind of social, it kind of fell under social inequity lines. So those who had a lack of time tended to be women. Those who had less money tend to be from particular regions outside capital cities, for example. 
And one thing we did notice, and um, on a personal note, I would say um, we were somehow contributing to is this idea of helicopter research or work. Um, so helicopter research is where you would be collaborating as a high income country, for example, with one of kind of um, kind of less high income, uh, so kind of middle to low income country. Um, and instead of doing it in an equitable fashion, you would do so in a way that that goes there to use the resources, some of the kind of traditional knowledge from the region, um, but get high co-authorship, get into a high paper, but not really work to develop um, the skills and the collaborations in a way that uh, the people in the lower income countries can benefit maximally. So not addressing any of these issues um, leads to further inequity. Uh, and from a training perspective, the goals will not be met in a sustainable manner. Now, some of these fall into the individual capacity um, kind of section, some in institutional, some on national level issues, some are cultural, but I'll also say this, um, some of these are worldwide phenomena, they're not um, singly uh, things that happen in Latin America or any particular Latin American country. Uh, the difference is other confounding factors um, could have make things a lot worse. Um, I did put a reference here to a great paper that was published a year or two ago around how to how global north researchers can um, stop propagating uh, helicopter research type practices and it's really worth a read it's re it's it's great so this um in collaboration with the groups in h3a bionet based around um, um africa so the pan-african uh, bioinformatics uh, hub uh, and ap bionet so that's asia pacific bionet and the cabana project um we came together and wrote a 10 simple rules paper on how to uh, organize bioinformatics training in low to middle income countries. Um, the main thing here is a lot of it is the same as other things you may expect to do within a course, uh, work, a course design and delivery workflow. So you would be defining topics, the aims, the target audience, considering budget, for example, finding trainers. But all of this needs to highly consider the local context. So if you want to deliver training in something that you think may be useful for a group in a lower to middle income country, you need to immediately find people in that region that you're going to talk to and really listen to and find out whether or not, first of all, it is relevant to them, whether they can use the information in a way that is conducive to their capacity increasing in whatever you're training them in, um, and then consider all the different challenges that have to be mitigated um, in the things you're designing. Usually it means it takes a little bit more time, but it's usually worth it. It means that people are better understanding what it is you're there to do. Uh, you would have helped to create training that is sustainable so other people in the region can then take your training even after you have left and um, use it again. So that's falling into this category of fair training. Um, and also being prepared for any infrastructure issues that might arise. So some of these can be things such as having screenshots prepared, having printouts ready, um, having backups on backups and backups. The more prepared you are, the better the sessions in the course will be. Um, and these are the kinds of things that you can read in the paper um, that was published last year by um, many contributors from across uh, the global south. Um, for Cabana, we did actually end uh, about a month ago and we reached all the kind of goals that we said uh, we promised to the donor. So we del delivered 28 bioinformatics workshops. Only a portion of these were delivered by uh, the original consortium. Uh, we had to find many collaborators across the region in topics that um, we did not have existing capacity in and work in a way that was as equitable as possible to ensure the training was delivered and also look into um, things such as gender equality and indigenous populations that we can reach out to as well. Um, so we're very kind of happy that we trained over 800 people in bioinformatics and awarded many travel fellowships to allow people to go into other regions and deliver training so that others can then teach others how to do bioinformatics. Some tips, how can you contribute to training? You do not have to be a lecturer or performer to contribute to training. You can contribute to any part of the training uh, workflow, whether that's being an assistant on the day, uh, virtual call support, organizing various aspects of the training, advertising or publicity after the fact, proofreading any content or designing the material and documentation, uh, help with recording and post-production, translation to other languages, communicating with various people in training, 
And the one that I think is um, quite important to me, advocating for considering the needs of various countries and ELMICs, really listening, really asking. These are some additional resources um, that will be available uh, that can support any training that you want to do, especially within um, ELMICs and different topics. Just a quick thanks to everybody involved in the project as well, um, and the funders and photo credits from Jeff. Thank you for listening. Any questions? And you can ask me anything. This is wonderful. Thank you so much, Bev. Uh, I've personally learned a lot from uh, yeah from the talk, um, especially the paper. I'm going to have a look at it to read it. Uh, thank you so much. Um, please, guys, if you got any questions, feel free to unmute yourself, or you can add it in the chat Zoom, or you can add it into the Etherpad. We have a couple of questions in the Etherpad. One of them is asking. And it was from me, how do you measure, actually, what metrics do you use to measure the success of the training and the capacity building? Thank you, Batul. Um, so the metrics we use to measure the success of training. Um, so there's a, there's a template we use uh, for post-course feedback, um, which asks a variety of questions. Uh, the ones that are seen as quality indicators uh, around, um, you know, just rating on a scale of one to five, essentially, um, how the entire course was perceived by the uh, trainee. Um, but then after that, there's a number of different questions that delve into each session's um, kind of quality rating, what was perceived as the best part of the course or the worst part, um, whether uh, the course would be recommended to other people is quite an important one. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we would look at to see um, in the short term, at least, whether the training was good. There's also a six month um, feedback and two year feedback. This is long term feedback. Um, and that's so that uh, we can see over time if there's anything that goes from these kind of course quality metrics into the impact metrics, whether people were using it to enhance their research or whatever the work they did. Is there any kind of a strategy do you use when you try to collect that feedback? So as far as I see, like in my own experience, I'm going to speak about my own experience. When we ask trainees to provide feedback, they hardly do. So after 10, we will get one of them like filling in uh, the feedback form. Do you, do you have any kind of strategy to get more feedback? Yeah. Uh, yes. So the best method I found is before the training session ends, if it's a live training, so most of ours were live, uh, we would essentially have a feedback session that lasted about 15 minutes or so, where we would say, oh, thanks for coming to the training, hope you had a great time. Um, here's the feedback form, we take your word seriously, and kind of just show that uh, essentially it doesn't take very long to fill and ask them to do it before they leave the call. That's usually what's worked best. And then we do a follow-up email afterwards um, to uh, ask anyone who hasn't to then complete it. Um, I've seen in the past that people withhold um, certificates um, of participation until they have um, written their feedback. I don't really like it personally, but it gets results. Um, but I don't, I, I, I try not to tell people to do that. So um, yeah, I'd be interested if there's any other methods that have worked for people. Well, thank you. I'm going to try these steps. Thank you so much for sharing them. We've got um, a lot of questions coming in. Uh, some people asking, how do you revise or update the materials used in the workshop? And if you do want a kind of e-learning, uh, uh, what kind of setup do you use as well? So for e-learning, um, there was a setup that was uh, first used based on um, some of the um, Embly BI uh, kind of training, and then it moved over and about halfway through the project uh, to, to Latin American servers and kind of working a, in a way that was basically looking for Latin American infrastructure and the design was all there. Um, so this was a key part in the kind of sustainability and equitability. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what the infrastructure was, um, but I do know it's quite difficult to get e-learning materials updated, especially if it's um, somebody, uh, say a secondee who had six months to do some of the work and then has their research and the rest of their career to go for. So that can be quite difficult. I think that um, there's contribution pathways that haven't quite been nailed down yet where people can go in and just 
change them in a kind of Wikipedia type format or in a GitHub um, kind of format. Um, and I think that's sorely needed. Um, at the EBI, we do have um, a e-learning system online um, and there are things in the back end that let uh, various training officers know whether something's a year or two old and then they can ask people who are paid to um, you know, do a bit of training in their, in their time at work to then update it. But that kind of infrastructure isn't there everywhere, um, which is a problem. Oh, thank you. Um, and the last question is about hybrid training, uh, which is a hot area these days. Uh, do you have any kind of strategy to hold the hybrid training sessions? It's a really good question. Um, so a few people have written papers on the topic. Um, I know H3A Bionet, uh, so based in Africa, uh, they've been doing this kind of um, hub and spoke model. So they have um, some of the training is delivered remotely, but then there are people um, in different countries or different regions within different countries attending in person um, synchronously, so at the same time. And um, there's a lot of planning that goes into it. And this is probably the one thing I'm going to say. Test, test, test. Test everything small scale, start small, um, scale it up, see what happens. Um, hybrid training is something that I've or hybrid events is something I've seen a lot more in Latin America, actually. Um, I don't know if this is because um, for some reason in certain parts of Europe, it's just not seen as the thing to do. We're either going to be fully virtual or fully in person. Um, but certainly when I was in Latin America last month, I saw many hybrid events. And they worked really well. They needed a lot of people. They need a, lo a lot of testing beforehand, a lot of um, backups ready just in case. That's the kind of thing that I would advocate for. And um, as many trainers um, who are either in person or um, kind of virtual to be able to uh, be on, yeah, be on hand just in case something doesn't go the way it's supposed to. Yeah, I totally agree. It's very, very challenging with the hybrid training. It's really meticulous. Um, yeah, set up. Um, I've been to twice uh, event which is hybrid, and yeah, and it's totally different. Both of them it is it's very, very challenging. Uh, thank you so much, Bev, for really. Um, inspiring and enlightening talk thank you so much uh, i'm gonna move now to our second speaker uh, alex who's gonna speak about open access in the preprint thank you but so uh, thanks for inviting me thanks for having me today uh this is such a warm group of people uh feel a lot of good energy from from you guys um so i'm going to share my screen Hopefully you're all seeing it. I will be talking about open access and preprints. Uh, this is it's a lot to cover in 10 minutes, so I'll do my best. And uh, But if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them later. So my name is Alex Mendonca. I am the coordinator of uh, preprints at Cielo Brazil. So just briefly about Cielo, uh, we are an international open science cooperation program oriented to the development of research communication capacities and infrastructures through a decentralized network of national collection of open access peer-reviewed journals. We were we launched it in 19, 1998 and since then we uh, we have uh, uh, let's say exported or other 16 countries have adopted the, the Cielo publishing model, which they form together the Cielo network. Uh, so we are open access since day one. For us, it's, it was a matter of uh, do or die. Uh, this is a, um, a print from a, a paper that was published in a, a scientific American journal in 1995. And it's basically the inspiration behind Cielo. It talked about the lost science in the third world, how the science that was made uh, here in, in Latin America was not visible, was not accessible, was practically didn't exist. So with that, I don't know if you're all familiar with this uh, piece of art from, from this uh, artist, Joaquin Torres uh, from uh, Montevideo, Uruguay. 
which basically is, means that the South is our North. So this is uh, a big inspiration for us because uh, we see this is, uh, it's about being pride or being proud of our own products and developing our own methodology and, 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 and doing our own thing uh, because it was the only way to do it. And so being open access since day one was the only strategy because that's, that was the only way that we could be, that our science could be seen and could be uh, read and, and cited and et cetera. So I know that sustainability, when it comes to open access, sustainability is a very, um, it's always a hot topic when we talk about open access. Uh, and I wanna briefly talk that the CLO journals are sustained by a mix of funding. So we have those that are fully funded by funding agencies. We have those that are fully uh, APC based, article processing charge. And we have also the hybrid ones uh, that have portion is funded and then the rest is covered uh, by APC charges. Currently, 31% of the Cielo Brazil journals collect some sort, some form of APC. And Cielo supports the use of APC as a means to sustain open access. This is a very, uh, it can be very um, controversial topic, but Cielo supports it. Uh, supports open, uh, sorry, supports APC for, for as a means to sustain open access. Uh, here, I just wanted to bring uh, the conceptual evolution of Cielo. So we started here in around 97, which was a pilot project. And until 2013, we were pretty, pretty uh, focused on building our core collection and the transition from the print to the digital way of publishing. Then uh, later, once we were already well settled, settled in, settled in we, were, we started to enhance the way we, we uh, publish uh, using online tools and using digital, digital way of publishing. And now, uh, since 2018, we started our transition to open science. So this was a very natural progression for Cielo. We were born in open access and open access is just one aspect of open science. So it made a lot of sense for us to move towards open science. And for us, open science means these four things here, uh, preprints, open data, open peer review and interoperability. So this is how we envision the, the open uh, science uh, research communication flow, uh, we see that the manuscript submission uh, and data is, uh, is, is also, it precedes everything else, right? And then you have the preprint, which is for us is the first stage of the communication workflow. Then once the preprint and the data are available, uh, the author can choose to send you a journal, for example, and then everything else happens as it traditionally does. Uh, so we're talking here about the publish then review uh, method, way of doing uh, science. And this is how we are envisioning it. So what is a preprint, right? I don't know if everyone is familiar with it, with the concept, but just to clarify, uh, this is, there are many different uh, uh, definitions of what a preprint is, but at Cielo, we use the definition from ESA, ESA bio, which is this one. This uh, preprint is a scientific manuscript that is uploaded by the authors to a public server. Uh, while some servers perform brief quality control inspections, the author's manuscript is typically posted online within a day or so without peer review and can be viewed without charge by anyone in the world. So to put it simply, preprints are manuscripts that are either not evaluated by a journal or already evaluated, but in process of publication. So I wanna, I would like to briefly talk about our server, the Cielo preprint server. The address is preprint.cielo.org. We launched it two years ago on April 7th. 
We operate under Open Preprint System. It's a platform that, that was developed by PKP, the Public Knowledge Project, in collaboration with Cielo. We currently have uh, over 1,600 preprints available with 2.4 million total views as of uh, last month. The preprint with most views has around 238,000, sorry, 238,000 uh, views. And this is following the counter methodology that excludes robots and uh, duplicate access and stuff like that. We are multidisciplinary, so we accept every uh, discipline. And we are also multilingual. We accept currently Portuguese, English, and Spanish, and we are considering including other languages uh, to address what Joy said in her, in her speech. We are very also interested in having uh, indigenous languages and uh, regional uh, languages. We have three levels of moderation that we call format, moderation, pre-moderation, and area moderation. And this is all in order to uh, build trust and to provide some sort of trust to, to our preprints because preprints, there's this misconception of uh, being bad quality, bad science. So we really want to address that and, and prevent and dismystify this wrong perception of preprints. So this is our portal. It's how, it's how it looks like if you access it. Uh, this is just a distribution by languages, we still receive uh, uh, most of our posted content. So this is these are the accepted submissions. Most of them are in Portuguese, followed by English and uh, shortly after Spanish. Uh, we recently launched an integration with uh, pre-review, which is uh, open peer review service for preprints which means that authors, they are offered the choice to request reviews to the pre-review community. And it's another very important component of open science. In terms of visibility, uh, back when we launched it, we were, uh, our preprints were uh, findable. They were indexed in, in our own search tool, Cielo Search, also in Google Scholar. And more recently, as of March uh, this year, we. Uh, we were indexed in European C, which uh, will hopefully bring even more visibility to our preprints. In terms of next steps, uh, we will continue building trust to our preprints and increase the, the visibility. Uh, there are many service, surveys that uh, were made to researchers uh, when asking about what they considered the most important uh, aspect in a preprint that will provide the trust, the necessary trust for them to actually read or, or rely or trust the preprint. And the first option, the first choice, the first answer is uh, usually related to having the associated data uh, to, to the manuscript available. So we are, um, we are looking at that and we are looking at integrating with uh, data, Dataverse uh, and other research data servers in order to uh, build trust to the preprint so that whenever whoever is reading the preprint can check the data and then uh, this will certainly bring uh, more uh, reliability to the to the work we're also looking in indexing cielo preprints in other indexes and directories uh, we were very happy with european c uh, but we we would like to be also indexed in other uh, indexers. In terms of opportunities and challenges, uh, we see preprints, uh, in terms of opportunities, we, we, we think they enrich and enhance more and more the coexistence between authors, preprints, and journals. Uh, and there's also the fact that authors have more control and autonomy in the, the communication of their research. They are in the center of, of this control. Uh, we also see opportunity for community engagement and increase of transparency. Uh, and also for, for the journals, we, we, since the beginning, Cielo has worked very closely to, to, to scientific journals. And we think that uh, when journals start accepting preprint and working with preprints, they are 
easing the, the transition towards open science. So preprint is a key component to ease this transition towards open science. And we are seeing that as, uh, already in our collection. In terms of challenges, there's the, the fragmentation of the same research that is, there has different incarnations, uh, for lack of a better term, that needs to be addressed. So uh, you used to have only the scientific paper, the, the published paper. Now you have the paper, you have the preprints of that version of record, you have the data, you have the, the reviews. So there are a lot of um, different instances of how this research will manifest itself. And it's a challenge because this fragmentation can, shall not, should not uh, uh, bring any uh, trouble for, for the authors and for the journals in terms of citations and visibility and, uh, and metrics. Uh, also preprints in the public eye is something that we should be, uh, it's a challenge because there are certain responsibilities and best practices that should be followed. Uh, when you are sharing a preprint and posting a preprint, spreading preprints around. Support and encouragement from funding agencies, it's still very shy, even, um, uh, even here. I mean, we are doing this for two years, but uh, our funding agencies are still not uh, completely on board with preprints. We are seeing some, some shift on that, but uh, before, before something like a, a major um, commitment happens, preprints will not take off uh, before that. And also, what is the role of preprints in the different disciplines of knowledge? Because we see some um, disparities. Uh, it's not, preprints are not equally used by every area of subject. So what are, what are the benefits and challenges and, and the, the problems with each area in using preprints. So to conclude, uh, Cielo sees preprints as an integral part of a research workflow, as I showed before. Uh, Cielo journals need to take appropriation of preprints, uh, acknowledge their benefits, recognize their benefits, and what they mean within each area of discipline. There's also a potential new role for journals they not only will validate the research, but they also, they will validate how open the research is. Journals accepting submission of preprints is a first step towards open science. And the relationship between preprints and journals is constantly developing toward a more comprehensive uh, and open research flow. So in other words, the future is open, literally. So uh, I hope I wasn't too fast. I was concerned with time, but thank you for your uh, attention. I'll be happy to answer your questions now. Thank you so much, Alex. This is super impressive. Thanks a lot uh, for sharing all of that. Guys, if you have any question, please feel free to add it to the chat Zoom, or you can unmute yourself or even add it to the Etherpad. We've got a couple of questions at the back. One of them is asking, did you have any kind of resistance for when you advocate for preprint in um, institutions and in universities uh, from senior researchers? Yeah, we, 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 we have. Uh, uh, we deal mostly with journals, uh, which uh, we, we don't talk directly to institutions, but you can say that some journals are a part they represent the institutions. So we we found a lot of resistance from from the journals. We still do. Uh, there are there are some journals that are very uh, they're afraid. They have concerns regarding uh, let's uh, to put it simple simply the, the the very existence of the journal. There are some concerns whether preprints will replace the journals in the future. So there is this this kind of concern that we are. Uh, working closely, we don't we don't want preprints to replace journals. We we see as uh, as I said in my my final slide, we, we think that there's a new role probably for the journals that's going to to come. So there's a lot of resistance, uh, especially because it's a new and there's not a lot of information. So uh, when whatever there's something new when uh, nobody has done it yet people are usually uh, afraid to, to invest 
uh, but once from our experience, uh, everything that we've done in the past there that, that was bold or ambitious or very um, game changer, there's always those journals, there's those few journals that take the lead and then the others will follow with time because uh, once they've seen the benefits and uh, that they didn't, let's say that there wasn't a, there wasn't a big problem or uh, there wasn't a setback, then everyone else is comfortable in order to, to, to follow the same path. But there's certainly a lot of resistance to this day. It's changing little by little, but uh, we still face a lot of resistance. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Wherever I go, I see a lot of resistance when it comes to rebrand a lot, whether it's in the global south or even the global north, both. Uh, there's someone typing in the chat. Uh, I don't know if they want to unmute themselves and um, share the question. They're asking if you have any idea how to decrease the importance, be review, and increase the importance of the trust in pre-brand. Yeah, I think he's asking about how do you promote pre-brand more actively, um, uh, particularly that people, they trust more be review rather than pre-brands, uh, apart from sharing and underlying data that's mentioned earlier. Yeah, and I think it's uh, it's okay to a certain degree to to have this, this skepticism. Skepticism is very important in science, so it's okay to question things. Uh, and we are we are taking some measures. As I said, I, we have a uh, three um, three levels of moderations. They are not, uh, let's say, completely uh, bulletproof. Uh, we may we we make make mistakes uh, and. But it's fine because at the end of the day, the author is responsible for what they are publishing. So Cielo is not responsible, but we still want to have a, 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 to maintain a certain degree of quality to preprints. So to have a, a certain level of skepticism towards preprints is healthy. Uh, and we are also, uh, we're not done yet. This is, this is not it. There are many things that we still could do. And, that the community can uh, uh, also engage in, in other practices such as sharing the, the data and doing open peer review. Uh, this is still very much in the early stages. Uh, there's a big culture change that needs to, be, uh, needs to happen for us to move to this next step. Uh, but once we have all these components during their their, their job, let's say you have the preprint, but you also have the data associated with it. And then you have the, the peer review uh, that, that someone that did it in an open platform. When you have all these components, then uh, it becomes more and more uh, trustable. Uh, and so uh, we're doing our best and, and there are, there's, there's certainly more things that we could do, but there's also a component of uh, cultural change in, 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 how the, in how science is done because it's been done the same way for centuries and now it's changing. So it, it requires some, some time, some training. I'm, I'm certainly taking some, some tips from, from Pib's presentation. Very, very insightful and profound. Thank you, Alex. I think we've got also uh, some comments in the chat. I think Esther is saying that a certain level of skepticism to any article, so uh, whether it's peer review or not, is very, very healthy. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure about time. I think we've got six minutes left, right? Um, can I ask one more question? Okay. Um, we have one beautiful question. And someone asking, uh, how would you like to see the publishing or reprinting scholarly communication in general in 10 years from now? Wow, that's a very good question. Uh, we, uh, we are really working hard to have uh, our journals fully operating in, in open science uh, uh, communication flow by the end of 2025. So that's less than... Uh, that's less than, than 10 years. Uh, but by, by then, 10 years from now, we really hope that uh, the, the scientific communi communication will be uh, more and more used to the, to the open science uh, best practices. Uh, and that 
the research uh, researcher will, since the beginning, since the very early stages, we already think in uh, in open science, because what we what we are seeing now, we are in the transition. So uh, researchers are now very used to how they they do research because they've been doing that, as I said, uh, for years and years. And now we are changing, so we are going through a hybrid phase. But what we would like to see is that uh, for researchers to start thinking about, just to think openly since the, the beginning of the research, because it's much easier when you start uh, collecting your data, you already uh, put your data in a repository, uh, then you, by the end of the process, you have a, an article, you have the data, uh, you have everything, you don't have to go after those things and kind of go backwards. Uh, so um, we believe and we hope that in 10 years, uh, researchers will be much uh, more familiar, familiarized with uh, doing uh, open uh, research and also for the funding agencies to become more and more uh, uh, in favor of it. Uh, we really are very strong in, in doing open science. So uh, if we can do that by the end, by, by before 10 years or in 10 years, then that would be great. And also we really want to, uh, journals to keep living regardless if they would change the, the, their, their role, uh, which seems to be the case. Uh, we really don't want to see them going anywhere. They are very important. They have a very uh, important place in scientific communication flow that might change, uh, but it's not a definitely, it's, they're not going anywhere, hopefully. Thank you. Uh, yeah, must be very optimistic about the future. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to hand it now to you because I think we have like three minutes left. Over to you. Amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Batul and Alex and Piv um, and all our amazing speakers. Uh, so it has actually been super cozy today. I, I've been sitting and thinking um, all of our previous RLS cohort calls, this is totally the tiniest one. Uh, but we've never had cohort calls on a Monday before, which may be the thing that's the, the change there. So we'll have to think about that in the future. Um, I'm not too worried about it, though, because all of our previous cohort calls have between 30 and 60 views for this cohort. Uh, so people will absolutely be catching up. Um, so this is mostly for people who are catching up on YouTube. Uh, we have a, we don't have any assignments this week for um, the cohort. If you have any that you haven't had the chance to catch up on, now is a great time. Um, and week 11 is a mentor-mentee meeting. There's no cohort call. And then then week 12, there is a cohort call on diversity, inclusion, and ally skills. Um, those are the main things for the day. And thank you so much again and be beautiful, everyone. Have a lovely day, evening, morning, as it may be. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks,